Hey everyone, it's Marvin. Thanks so much for listening to Books and Boba. Uh, I just wanted to take a quick second to remind you that Books and Boba just launched our Patreon uh, to help support our future endeavors. Rira and I have been running Books and Boba for the last six and a half years, and we've always talked about wanting to do more, um, including expanding our content offerings, um, being able to go to book events, and do more coverage. And so um, to help us get closer to those ambitions, um, we started a Patreon to help us grow and to better support books by Asian and Asian American authors. We are offering two tiers for our Patreon. Um, the first is our regular Boba member coming in at $3 a month, which will give you access to our brand new Books and Boba Discord server so you can engage with your fellow Books and Boba Club members and also Rira and myself in real time. Uh, this is where we'll be aiming to move the bulk of our book club discussions. Uh, but rest assured, we'll still have a presence on Goodreads as well. And our premium tier is our Honey Boba member tier coming in at $5 dollars a month where in addition to access to our discord server you'll also get access to our monthly boba chats a bonus podcast where rira and i and some guests will get together each month and have a a more casual discussion on stuff that may or may not be book related as well as answer some listener q a honey boba members will also have access to a poll to help decide an official books and boba book pick uh, once per quarter so if any of that sounds interesting to you, um, support Books and Boba on Patreon by going to patreon.com slash books and boba. As always, we and I really appreciate your support. All right. Thanks for listening. And I'm on with the show. You're listening to Whoa. Hot Luck. Hot Luck. Welcome back to Books and Boba, a book club and podcast featuring books by Asian and Asian American authors. My name is Marvin Yeh. And I'm Ri Rayu. And on this episode, we have an author chat with Iris Yamashita, uh, the author of City Under One Roof, a new murder mystery set in the fictional Alaskan town of Point Medier. Iris is an Academy Award nominated screenwriter, uh, and this is her debut novel. Yeah, I had a really fun time talking to Iris. Um, like, as longtime listeners of the show will know, murder is my jam. <laughs> so, um, and also, like, this takes place in a town that I've been really curious about. So, yeah, um, I mean, this, yeah, so- it's a town that is, it, it's a town where everyone lives in a single high rise bu- building. So it is a very interesting setting and add a murder to it. And I'm like, yes. Yeah. It's not every day your um, your literary interest intersects with your um, online YouTube interests. That is true. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. We had a great time talking with Iris about how she got started writing, um, her career as an Asian American screenwriter um, in Hollywood and her debut novel. So, um, yeah, please enjoy our conversation with Iris. We're here with Iris Yamashita, who is an Academy Award nominated screenwriter. We are here to talk to her about her new novel, City Under One Roof. Thank you, Iris, for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to be here. Yeah, I'm really excited to talk about your book. Uh, I mean, once I heard the premise, I was like, this is definitely in my uh zone of interest. Uh, But before we get into the book, uh, where are you calling from? I'm calling from Alhambra, which is uh, basically in Los Angeles. (laughs) Oh, where are you? Uh, We're in the San Gabriel Valley as well. Oh, okay. Yeah, there's lots of great restaurants here (laughs) for us Asians. Yeah. Are you you originally from LA or um, are you a transplant? I'm a transplant. I was born in Missouri. I don't remember anything about Missouri because uh, when I was still a toddler, we moved to Hawaii. And I spent 10 years in Hawaii, so that's what I remember growing up. But I think I've spent most of my life here in California. Yeah, I wanted to ask because I was like, I wonder if she 
lived in Alaska at one point because her book is written in uh, written in Alaska, uh, based off of. Um, yeah, I wanted to see if you you know lived in Alaska in in, in your previous years, but. Wow. Hawaii. No, That's the complete uh, yeah. opposite. <laughs> it's the opposite. I only grew up in warm places. Um, I did spend four years on the island of Guam, which is uh, is fairly isolated, but it's not cold. Uh, I've never actually lived in Alaska, but I was very, very intrigued by um, the inspiration for the story, which is a real city in Alaska called Whittier, Alaska, where um, people do all mostly live in one building and it's a very isolated town where you can only get in through um, that tunnel or by boat. Yeah, we'll talk about uh, Point Matir uh, later on in our conversation. But before we get there, uh, how did you start writing? I mean, as an Asian American, we like to ask this question because (laughs) uh, writing and other creative fields, you know, for, for like first, second gens, it's it's hard to persuade our parents that this is a worthwhile uh, path. Oh, yeah, definitely. It's always been a passion. It's always been a hobby since I can remember as as a toddler. Um, I remember getting a uh, diary as a gift from someone. It was an empty diary. And I thought that I was supposed to be making up stories in it. (laughs) So I would write... I would write in the I voice, but it was uh, some different. It wasn't me. I, I wrote, I made up stories about someone living in another time period about myself. And that's what I would write in my diary. So I think it was just, I don't know, something innate, something um, I've always loved to do. I minored in writing, um, but yes, having those Asian parents It was very discouraging to try to pursue uh, writing or anything in the arts as your major or, you know, a possible form of income. So it was always just kind of a hobby. Like I would take night classes in writing and it was more um, as a way of fulfilling my needs. Um, and And I always wanted to write a novel, but I couldn't actually finish a novel because it took too much time. So I turned to screenwriting and I took classes in screenwriting and that's my that was my entry point. But then I found my way back to, uh, to writing novels. But I, yeah, I didn't think of writing as a career until I actually sold a screenplay, and then I quit my day job. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I saw in your bio that you studied engineering at UC San Diego, which, by the way, I also went there. So, uh, oh, really cool to see yay. that. <laughs> um, so, I guess, yeah, I want to, I want to know what was the, how did you go from engineering to writing? I mean, in terms of career wise, like um, you mentioned that you were you were writing on the side, but like writing a screenplay is also no small feat. Like those. those those manuscripts are huge. Um, like, how did you how did you manage that? Like, and I like mean, what- you say it's huge, but compared to a novel, like <laughs> ninety something pages versus uh, like eighty thousand words is exactly is, yeah <laughs> exactly. That's why I turned to screenwriting because working a full time job is very hard to get a novel finished. But um, on the screenwriting side, as you said, it's, you know, 90 to 100, 100 and some pages, mostly white space. And I thought, oh, I can actually finish this. And um, then I started entering contests after I had written a screenplay. And I was still working a full-time job. And I, I just kind of started submitting it to contests. And then I won a contest where one of the judges was a CAA agent. And then she picked me up and uh, I I continued to work full time because I, I still didn't have a job writing screenplays. And then um, we heard about uh, a project that Clint Eastwood was working on and they were looking for uh, someone with more of an authentic voice that, you know, that had some Japanese background. 
And so, you know, we thought, oh, well, you know, there's no chance in hell, but let's submit my, you know, a sample screenplay and let's see if we can get an interview. And so um, that was really what kicked off my career. And that was my my gig that I, for, you know, that I got um, for the first time in screenwriting. And then that's when, you know, I think I, I didn't, com- I still didn't quit my job until I had the signed contract in my hand. And then I finally gave my notice that, okay, <laughs> I can maybe I can try pursuing this. Yeah. I mean, Rira and I have been working um, in and around specifically the Asian American entertainment space for a while now. And you know, your film, Letters to Iwo Jima, came out in 2006, which was quite a while ago and you know there like for us at least there was kind of a a gap in like just representation in general for about a decade between your film and like 2018 when like crazy rich asians came out and everyone got interested in asians again um how was it like working as an asian american screenwriter during that period yes uh i'm i'm sorry to correct you but the name of the movie is letters from iwo jima oh, sorry <laughs> <laughs> sorry um and yes, it was a long gap. Um, I I did research some of the statistics. I came in when you know Asian American story or Asian stories or Asian American stories were not very commercial. And um, according to the Writers Guild of America, uh, 2010, which is after my movie was written, came out um the statistics were that 83% of working screenwriters were male and 95% of working screenwriters were white so <laughs> it was a very very tough slog um and i was known as the asian writer and so i wasn't getting a lot of projects because you know nobody was interested in making stories about Asians uh, or hiring Asian writers to write them. Um, I think it's gotten better for sure. Um, But in 2020, the same statistics from the Writers Guild was still 71% male and 77% white. (laughs) Um, so, you know, it's definitely improved. And I think in the last few years, it's really improved. So, um, that's a good news there. But, um, in my career, (laughs) when I started, it's been very tough, which is not to say that I haven't gotten a lot of work to keep paying for my Writers Guild health insurance and, um, that I could still make, uh, you know, a living out of it. Because uh, I, I feel like producers and directors were more open, um, but it, when it came to the buyers, which a lot of times, you know, they're basically run by accountants and, you know, statistics, um, that's where we would hit a wall and it wouldn't proceed any further. So I have a lot of kind of, you know, a graveyard full of dead scripts. <laughs> haven't been made, Yes. I feel like that is the life of a screenwriter, just having a graveyard of scripts and just trying and trying (laughs) and hoping that the, uh, you know, the top brass white men say yes to your story. But also, like, just because you're an Asian writer, they shouldn't assume that all you can write are quote unquote Asian stories. Uh, That's that's very interesting um, because I feel like that is also a struggle that a lot of Asian writers had before We Need Diverse Books, which came out in uh, 2015, I I believe. So you have We Need Diverse Books, and then you have Crazy Rich Asians. So uh, you have two kind of like big markers in, okay, like our stories are worth telling, and there are people who are willing to pay money to read and watch Asian (laughs) stories. I mean, it's like more like the the accountants that Iris mentioned said, oh, wait, these can make money. And then they changed their formulas. Yes, yes. <laughs> I think that's 
what was happening. And so fingers crossed that um, there have been enough successes of Asian and Asian American stories in Hollywood that um, it'll keep going. Fingers crossed. Yeah. Fingers crossed, indeed. (laughs) Well, uh, moving on to your book, uh, City Under One Roof. So as we mentioned, Point Meteor, which is the town uh, in your novel, it's inspired by the real life Alaskan town Whittier. Uh, When did you first learn about the town and how did your idea for a thriller germinate? Um, I first learned about the city over 20 years ago because I remember watching a documentary and it was a time when the tunnel was still closed to car traffic. So the only way into the city was by train or by boat. And so you couldn't even drive there. And I was just fascinated by the idea of this city where everyone basically lived in one building and how isolated it was and just thinking like, who would live here? You know, (laughs) what kind of people would populate this town? And it was always there in the back of my mind, but I hadn't come up with a story and um, it was over 20 years later, that I was trying to think of an idea uh, for a pilot because I was moving, I was trying to move from screenwriting to writing uh, for television or streamers. Um, And I knew I had to come up with uh, a sample of my work that would appeal to that space. And I you know, I had watched some streaming limited series on streaming that were so exciting to me um, that a lot of them revolved around mysteries. And I thought, oh, I, I want to try that. So um, then I remembered my creepy, weird setting. And I thought, oh, that's got to, you know, that's that's got to be something, you know, uh, probably a murder. So that's where it, it kind of started. And then as I started doing research on the real city, I just got um, hooked on a video of driving through the tunnel, the two and a half mile tunnel. And it's a one way, it it changes directions every half hour or so. And then it's also where the train comes through. So it's a very narrow tunnel and um, it's two and a half miles. So it's it's kind of a long drive through the tunnel. And I felt like, oh, I'm falling through the rabbit hole and I'm going to end up in some strange place with a lot of strange characters. And I just, oh, that's, that's going to be cool. And that's, that was the kind of jumping off point for coming up with the story and the characters. Yeah. I mean, your characters in this book are so distinct. I mean, you know, you think about what kind of people would live in like the edge of civilization and, um, you know, your your book says it's it's people with that's it's people that are running from something. It's people that want to get away from just you know modern civilization and just live on the edge. And I, I remember, you know, I definitely got like like maybe it's just res- residuals from your screenwriting like skill like um, past, but like definitely visualize this as as like a TV, like I got definitely got, you know, Twin peaks vibes of like going to a remote location with all these like distinct characters. The moment I, you meet the moose lady, I'm like, Oh, this, this feels like a, a, like one of those. And it's just, how long did it take for you to, to create all your characters? And you know, do you have stories for like all 200 of the residents there? Or <laughs> <laughs> That's a no. lot of people to create backstories. That is for. a lot of people. No, I don't have um, <laughs> stories for everyone in the building. Uh, I definitely had ideas for a number of characters. Um, I have, so I have, this is the first book where I have three voices. Um, I do have, I am working on a second book with, um, a little more about other or well, characters that did appear in book one, but a little deeper dive. Um, Yeah. And I think, again, because I was uh, thinking about Alice in Wonderland, you will find 
many Alice in Wonderland references in the book. No one, no one usually finds them. You have to be really geeky like me uh, to even associate some of them. But um, if I'm going with the Alice in Wonderland analogy, then Kara's kind of like Alice because she's the one you know who f- falls through the hole and then ends up in this quirky place being trapped there. And um, Amy, who is the Asian teenager who lives in town, is sometimes a white rabbit because Kara chases after her and for clues. And then I, my other voice is Lonnie, who has a, a mental disability, and she wears a different color beret every day. And so I just consider her like the Mad Hatter of the story. And you know, if you if you look, there's there's more character references and more Lewis Carroll references if you really hunt for them. Yeah, I totally missed the Alice in Wonderland, uh, like Easter eggs, should I say? Yeah, yes. I guess I'm not as literary as I as I thought. Um, but it's it's really funny, like reading this book during this time. I mean. For one, we we're still in an ongoing pandemic. It's COVID, and um, you know, like many people during COVID, they were not used to isolation. They're not used to being separated from the rest of society. But at the same time, it really gave some people opportunities to get to know their neighbors in the building. Like I've seen videos of, uh, you know people singing on balconies and putting on shows. Uh, and, you know, there are also people playing freaking tennis on their balconies as well. Um, so I, I have to ask, like, did you start writing this book at like the beginning of the pandemic? Um, no. And uh, sorry, that was actually Marvin's question before that I didn't answer. But oh, um, yeah. yeah, it's been years. Uh, I started writing. Um, or I, you know, what's coming up with the ideas before the pandemic hit. And, um, but yeah, the idea, of the, <laughs> <laughs> I, I was, uh, writing before the pandemic started. And so it was very unusual and unique at that time to be isolated in a building. But after COVID hit, it was sort of like, oh, now everyone <laughs> knows what it's like to be isolated, I think. And I don't know if that works in my favor or not. Um, you know, it's it's maybe not as unusual now, but on the other hand, maybe it's a, sh- you know, a shared experience. I, I'm not really sure. But um, yeah, I, uh, I can say, though, that um, COVID gave me a lot more time to write the novel (laughs) because I wasn't going out. I wasn't having to drive across town for all the meetings. Uh, So that was really a good time to really dive into the book and trying to get it finished. Yeah. I mean, recently, I don't know if you know this, but uh, the town of Whittier came back in spotlight because uh, a teenager who lives in in that building uh, start to make TikToks about, hey, this is where I live and (laughs) these are my neighbors. And I just thought it was like such a timely moment to release this book. I mean, not to say that like you planned it around, uh, (laughs) you know, TikTok, but... (laughs) um, Iris is like TikTok Nostradamus. She like forecasted (laughs) forecasted the trends and released her book at the right time. Yeah, I had no idea about the um, TikTok video. Someone had mentioned I don't even have a TikTok account, so I had no clue. But I kept hearing about about this, about the person who is doing the videos. And I thought, oh, this is really cool. Maybe now people know about this place. So, um, yeah, I yeah. mean, just looking at the building and just like the layout of like how these people live, it was very accurate to what you wrote in the book. Like I could imagine the elevators and the hallways. And I was just wondering, did you have like a map? Like how did you uh, like write such descriptive scenes of the building? Uh, I 
I did do a, a lot of research on the actual building, and there were people be- before the TikTok videos who had, you know, kind of um, had videos or explanations. And then I did visit the town myself. I stayed in the building. And um, it was very interesting, and it was it was fun <laughs> to talk to the locals. I mean, obviously, none of none of my characters are, are based on any real people in Whittier. I just want to say that because I don't want anyone to be upset. <laughs> but um, yeah, they uh, the place um, and the details. I I kind of knew what it was like and that also inspired um the characters as well for me. Uh yeah, yeah, one of the things um that I discovered when I actually went to visit Whittier and you know for research is how diverse the population really is, which is is really was really interesting to me what kind of people chose to live there. Like people from Samoa and you know islands and the Philippines and you know from very, it was very international. Yeah, I that was going to be my next question about like the diversity of your cast, and I was curious. I was like, is this something that is realistic for a building with two hundred so people at the edge of civilization <laughs> to have like this many diverse characters? And I actually looked at the twenty twenty census of Whittier, and it was thirty seven percent white, twenty three percent Asian. Native Hawaiian or Pacific Islander, and 12.5% Native American. And I was like, holy crap, that's really diverse. Uh, I mean, we're saying this as people from California. So um, yeah, like, I I guess you already answered my question. You found out when you were there. And um, I just wanted to ask, like, like, was that something you had originally planned to have like um you know an asian american teen in your book and uh other like ethnicities in the book uh i think there were some things that were planned for instance i <laughs> i was joking with my husband that there's you know there's a chinese restaurant everywhere i bet there's oh, one in true. whittier and then i looked it up and sure enough there's a chinese restaurant in whittier i'm like okay so now i know i can have a you know i can have an asian character in the story and um but i didn't yeah i didn't know how diverse it actually was until i visited there and then I thought this is so cool like I I really like that aspect too of this town and you know I have to change some of my characters now I think you know to be more diverse to to um kind of reflect uh, a little bit of the diversity of the real town and and how cool I think that is yeah also um like how was your research like on the indigenous representation in your book yeah, I mean, there were a lot of things that I learned um, in the process, and I, but I, I feel like um, I wanted to do more research and talk to. Uh, for for my second book, I am trying to get um, uh, some input from indigenous people living in Alaska, so that it will feel more authentic. But, you know, I, of course, I try to do my research. Um, I'm sure I might have some aspects wrong, but um, I, you know, some people who helped me in the editing process who knew a little bit more also helped me in a way understand. I I mean, I did discover through my own research that um, uh, Native lands in um, in Alaska, the way they're designated is very different from the the rest of the lower forty eight. So, um, yeah, there were a lot of there are a lot of things that I had to learn, and a lot of things are still changing. Like there's laws that I read about um, when they were originally designating them as villages instead of reservations. Um, they're in Alaska; they're called native villages. And um, what the laws are, and then you know, 
in the in the last five years, the cha- you know there's certain laws that change. So it was very confusing to me because things are constantly evolving, and even you know people who live in Alaska say you know it's it's hard to keep track of all the changes in the laws. So that that was a difficult aspect for me. Yeah. Well, I mean, City Under One Roof is um, a mystery. And, you know, you mentioned a little bit about how you always want to write a mystery. Um, but what drew you to this genre? Like what what made you actually sit down and say, OK, I'm going to plot out this mystery and I'm going to make it thrilling and, and twisty? Um, when I was teaching screenwriting, interestingly, I always say that it's good to start off with a question. <laughs> so when I think about it, you know, mysteries always start with a question. Uh, but yeah, I didn't think of it as a genre for me. I think um, until I, uh, I think I was very inspired by Jane Campion's Top of the Lake, which was a mystery. Um, and, you know, had, a, again, like a, a cool place and a lot of cool characters. And I was kind of drawn by that story thinking, oh, that's, that's really cool. I want to, I want to try something like that where it's, it's a, it's a mystery, but it's not necessarily like a whodunit so much. Um, but I mean, it, ha- you know, has a little bit of everything. It's very dramatic. Uh, but the the characters are super interesting and the place is super interesting. So I wanted to try something along that vein. And that was the inspiration. Yeah, this started out as an idea, as I said previously, um, for a possible series. And it was just going to be a sample. I was just, I was just going to write the pilot and it was just going to be a sample. Um, but, uh, you know, when you're pitching, obviously, you have to come up with a lot more than just a pilot because uh, there were producers who were interested in the pilot and who wanted to um, try to sell it as a series. And so then I had to do a lot more work uh, coming up with what the season would look like and then also what a possible subsequent season might look like. And so I, you know, I did all this work and eventually I had enough that. I thought I could write a novel out of this. So that's what happened. Yeah, but writing a screenplay, um, everything is written in third person. You don't really, it's very um, internalized. That's why it relies a lot on an actor's ability to express the uh, character's thoughts. But for a novel, you're actually in the character's head and you have three POVs in your book, you have Amy, Lonnie, and Kara, who is the investigator who gets stuck at this town. Uh, how did you decide on which characters to assign POVs, and what was it like exploring uh, their perspectives? Yeah, I don't know. Um, I don't know why. I just right off the bat thought I would like to have three voices, um, which is the fun thing about writing a novel as opposed to writing a script is that you can, you can really deep dive into multiple characters, POVs, but I mean, also in um, streaming and television, as opposed to uh, film, um, you know, having multiple points of view is also um, a little more, you know, that you, you do go into different characters, POVs in, in that, in that world. Uh, but I, I did um, go back and forth between the third person and the first person. Like I, at first I was going to make each character. I have, you know, the character's name at the top of each character. And then I was just going to use the first person. I did this. And then, um, and then I read someone say, Oh, whenever I see one of those, I, you know, first person books, I toss them. <laughs> so then I thought, oh, let me try doing it in third person. So, and then I was going back and forth. So then what I finally settled on was a third person narrative, but um, I forgot what the term was, but a deeper, like as if the character were speaking, as if it was their voice, but still using third person. She, she did this. So um, that's what I I settled on, which is kind of a compromise. It's a third person, but very deep 
um, into the character's voice. Yeah, Amy is an intriguing character. I mean, not just because she is Asian American and we can relate to her, but she's one of the few kids who are who is a permanent resident of uh, Point Medier. Um, can you tell me how you came up with her character and just uh, why you decided to make her Asian American? Um, I. You know, I like the idea of diversity, and again, as I did my research on the the, the town that this uh, place was inspired by, finding out how diverse it is, I really did want to have um, an Asian voice because obviously I'm Asian, and um, seeing if there was, you know, a different uh, having that perspective of being an Asian American in this in this little tiny town. Um, and I think I, it was just the idea that, you know, there's a, a, a Chinese restaurant everywhere, <laughs> it seems like. And so that was a, kind of the idea that first started, like, there's got to be, you know, an Asian family living here. And um, I, I think it was discussing with my husband to why, why to, why is there a Chinese restaurant in the most remote places. Um, he did, he actually drove across country and he told me about this where um, he decided he was only going to eat Chinese food as he, <laughs> as he drove across the country and he would go to the remotest places and there would be a Chinese restaurant. And then he would try to talk to the owner or the people there and try to get their story. And I just thought that was kind of fascinating. So I thought, What's what's the story for, you know, this family living in this really remote town? Why would they why would they move there? So that was that was inspiration. I love how the restaurant in your book, Star Asian Food, is like not a good Asian restaurant. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I like that even the people, the non-Asian people going there recognize that this is not good Chinese food. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean not everybody who, you know, starts a, a Chinese restaurant has a background of being a Chinese chef. Again, you know, they might have multiple reasons for why they came here. And, you know, they, they maybe the restaurant was an easier thing to start up. Not sure. But that doesn't mean they're going to be an excellent chef. <laughs> so that was kind of the idea there, too. And, you know, the linchpin of any mystery novel is the investigator uh so can you tell us a little bit about how you came up with with your main investigator yes she was actually um one of the tougher characters to develop because again like it's easier coming up with quirky characters and you know the idea of this wonderland so you're going to have odd characters with interesting stories but she being the protagonist has to have more of the you know, the even keel, the normal voice that we latch on to who's, you know, coming, stepping into this world. But at the same time, you know, I didn't want to make her boring. So um, I figured that she has to also have some kind of story and some background. And uh, I just at some point realized uh, that she has to have a secret as well. So, um, you know, so everybody, including our protagonist, has to have some uh, some secret and some reason for being there. So coming up, yeah, coming up with her story was a little bit harder, but um, I knew there had to be something there. And once I discovered what that was, it helped propel an idea for the second book. Yeah, I feel like you know, as as a writer, it would have been easier to just make her the the first uh, first police investigator uh, who's there to, dis uh, to discover the murder. But you bring her as like the follow up investigator. And I think that made it more intriguing because you're like, why is she following up on a case that already seems like it's solved? It's shut. Um, so I thought that was like an interesting trait to uh to bake into her. 
Um, so we talked about secrets and why people would live in a, a remote town like uh, Point Medier. And um, domestic violence is a recurring element in your story. And it's woven into the fabric of some of your characters. And um, I did my own little research and I found out According to the 2020 survey in in Alaska, it was found that nearly half of adult Alaskan women experience intimate partner violence in their lifetime. Was this a fact that you were already aware of and you based your um, you already knew of and started developing your characters around that? Or was that something you had to add afterward? Um. When I started writing, one of the things that was very intriguing to me, and again, this is from the time uh, over 20 years ago when the only way in was by train and or by boat, um, I had read some little snippet about how there was a woman who lived in the building who was hiding from her ex. and. Um, the train, so the only way in uh, was by train or boat. So the train conductor uh, knew about her ex, that he was, you know, abusive, and um, he wouldn't let him on the train. And so this idea, you know, that it was sort of a, a haven for, um, you know, for at least in this case, it was a, a woman who had been abused by her ex was again very intriguing and then I started doing the research as you had mentioned and discovered that same fact about how prevalent um domestic violence is in Alaska and um yeah my statistics that I read was over half of the women had experienced some kind of um sexual or domestic violence and that was very surprising to me. And so I wanted to weave it in even more. And um, I mean, a lot of it has to do with uh, the remoteness of all these little towns and how it's hard to police them. So Alaska is considered like the most dangerous state in the U.S. for women. Yeah. It, it makes sense because like you said, the remoteness, like, uh, like how would a police uh, station be able to cover all that ground. And also there's like no one uh, overseeing the, uh, I guess, like the quality of the job that they do. So they could be really bad at their job and uh, kind of let corruption happen. And uh, domestic violence is something that even police officers in major cities, uh, they don't even take it seriously. So I can imagine it's much worse in uh, remote places like Alaska. Yes, definitely. Definitely. Uh, this is more of a craft question. Um, because you are a screenwriter, did you have a beat sheet for your novel? Like, how did you structure it? Uh, yes, I do. Um, I do usually start out with some kind of roadmap, some kind of blueprint. Um, and in the case of this book, I, um, it wasn't even out of choice. I would, I mean, I probably would have done it anyway, but, uh, as part of my contract, I needed to submit a chapter outline because when, um, when my first book was sold, I had not, uh, yet completed it. Uh, and so, um, the condition of the sale was I needed to, uh, basically beat out the rest of the chapters. And I submitted that. Uh, so, um, yes, I did. I, I mean, it was a chapter by chapter. It wasn't a beat sheet, but it was a chapter by chapter outline. Um, but, you know, everything always ends up changing. So, oh, yeah. 100%. <laughs> I, yes. I don't know a single writer who has like, you know, successfully followed everything on their outline it's just impossible <laughs> yeah uh, it, it always ultimately changes but it's I think it is good to have something like that because it gives you um somewhere to go like you you know I do 
generally know how it's going to end. I mean, it might change slightly, but um, if you don't have that, you can easily get stuck and then you can easily get, it, yeah, you, that, that is probably why I couldn't finish a novel when I was starting out. And then I turned to screenwriting and then I kind of learned more tools about, you know, how to, how to uh, do your beat sheets and how to structure a story. And so I think that ultimately it did help me when I came back to writing novels of having more structure in my story and having more of a roadmap. Um, And also um, I started writing my novel the same way I was writing my scripts, which is to start with a, a vomit draft. I call it, it's where you just don't, um, where it's more like stream of conscious writing and you just want to get yourself to the end. And then you have kind of a, a, more of an outline of your entire story and then go back and edit. Because if you, you know, you're trying to make everything perfect on the first go around, you're never going to finish. So, um, yeah, I learned those kind of tools of the trade. Yeah, I like asking mystery authors like how they structure their books because we've had authors like, say, for example, Mia P. Monansala, who is the author of Arsenic and Adobo. Uh, she said she didn't even know who the killer was when she was drafting. And there are other authors who, you know, they're like, I know exactly how it's going to end. I like I wrote the ending first and then went back and like wrote the rest of the book. So it's really interesting to see how uh, everyone's process is different. Right. Yeah, that's interesting. I mean, I guess um, I did in my second book, I did kind of waver around like the ending, like who, yeah, who is the, like, who did it? Who's the, <laughs> yeah, who did who's it? The big like, bad. <laughs> yeah, I did. I did. I think I did kind of change who was, I mean, I, I, have a general, I mean, I have a general sense of where it's going to go at the very end, but um, sometimes the who done it part of it is not that important, you know? Like, you want to make sure you have your character arcs and, you know, you have a story arc, but it may not matter as much, like, who actually did it. So I could see that, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. And also, it, it's your sophomore novel. So, uh, like, we've interviewed a lot of authors on this podcast, and they always mention how, like, the sophomore novel is much harder to write, and it could be difficult to uh, finish the draft as well. So I can understand why, like, at the end, you're like, I don't know, I'm wavering a little bit. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, I, I do find my second book to be a lot harder. <laughs> I think also <laughs> because the time pressure is greater. You know, I had a lot of years to write book one, but then book two, it's like, it's under it's contract. Gotta be written quickly. And so it is a lot harder. <laughs> yeah. As, um, as constant procrastinator, there's nothing like a good deadline to get you get like that fire. Oh, yeah. Life. Definitely. It's like the most dangerous thing in my life procrastinating because <laughs> I don't do extreme sports or anything. It's like live life on the edge of a deadline. <laughs> Yeah, I kind of I tell people um to you know, you get you get overwhelmed if if you're thinking I've got to write this novel in this time and get it done. But if you try to break it down into bite-sized pieces, it becomes a little more palatable. Like, you know, I don't have to write a perfect draft the first time and I just, you know, I have to write this I have to get through these chapters, but it can be a shit draft. Oh, wait, can I yeah, you can curse. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It can be <laughs> okay. It, it can be a, a really bad draft. Um, but just get it done and then go back and okay, but I'm gonna allocate this much uh time for editing. And again, it doesn't have to be perfect. Like if you keep thinking it doesn't have to be perfect and you can always go back, then it's a little less pressure. Yeah, this is good advice for the people yeah. who just completed uh, NaNoWriMo. Uh, rewriting is uh, writing and <laughs> perfection doesn't exist. <laughs> yeah, because especially your first drafts, you know, everything's going to change. So um, don't be precious. Don't be precious. Well, your debut novel, uh, City Under One Roof, is coming out on January 10th. Yes, right? That's still the January date. 10th. Yes. So exciting. 
Is there anything else you're working on besides besides your novels? Uh, so yes, so book two is due pretty soon. Um, meanwhile, I do putter around still in Hollywood, and um, I am trying to get some Asian American themed uh, projects out uh some are further along than others um just crossing my fingers that one of them will see the later day. <laughs> <laughs> but i've been able to work with some really great people some great producers so knock on wood that one of them gets through <laughs> yeah. yeah thank you so much and that was Iris Yamashita, the author of City Under One Roof, which is releasing um, or probably just released um, in bookstores everywhere on uh, January 10th, 2023. Um, we'll probably have the link to the book if you're interested in our bookshop. Um, as always, a purchase from our online bookshop will support both your local bookstores and the Books and Boba um, podcast. Yes. So for the people who are joining us for our book club discussion, we are reading the latter half of Babel by R.F. Kwan. So for December, we read the first 12 chapters. And at the end of January, we're going to be talking about the rest of the book. And we'll see if any of our predictions came true. <laughs> yeah. So if you've already read um, Babel to completion, um, please let us know your thoughts on a group forums um, because we are covering the rest of the book. All spoilers are now on the table. So if you want to discuss plot points or things that you liked about the book, um, feel free to post. Um, for courtesy, though, um, if you are posting anything spoilerly, uh, please use um, the spoiler tags for people who might accidentally click on that link. But we're excited to hear from you and hopefully include some of your feedback in our discussion episode. And with that, that'll do it for this episode of Books and Boba. Thanks once again to Iris Yamashita for joining us to talk about her book of City Under One Roof. And yeah, we'll see y'all next time. Bye, everybody. Bye. Thanks for listening to Books and Boba. This podcast was hosted by Marvin Yue and Rira Yu and edited and produced by Marvin Yue. Follow the book club on Twitter and Instagram by going to at Books and Boba and engage with us on Goodreads on our Goodreads group. You can also check out past episodes of the podcast by going to booksandboba.com and by subscribing to us on your favorite podcast app. Don't forget, you can support Books and Boba and Asian American authors by purchasing books at our bookshop.org account. Check out the link in our show notes and also at booksandboba.com. Books and Boba is a proud member of the Potluck Podcast Collective, a collective of Asian American hosted podcasts featuring unique voices and stories from the Asian diaspora. Learn more about The Collective and check out our fellow Potluck shows by visiting the website podcastpotluck.com. Thanks for listening. Hey, I'm Bill Yu, and you may know me from a blog called Angry Asian Man. And I'm Jeff Yang, author, journalist, and celebrity dad. We host a podcast called They Call Us Bruce, an unfiltered conversation about what's happening in Asian America. Each week or so, we host a discussion about some of the most vital and interesting topics in our pop culture and our community, bringing in guests who are shaping and informing this thing called Asian America from Hollywood to D.C. and beyond. Uh, we got media, entertainment, food, family, politics, representation, the good, the bad, the WTF of it all. So check us out wherever you get your podcasts or at theycallsbruce.com. Peace. Peace.